Okay, thank you everybody for showing up today. So this panel uh, conversation is really about art outside of the traditional spaces of art, whether it be a theater, a gallery, et cetera. Um, so we're gonna also talk about maybe a little bit of historical precedence, um, some about your own work. So the first thing I wanna do is make sure that all of you introduce yourself and maybe say anything about the topic. Maybe you could introduce your work or say what your relationship is to the topic we're gonna talk about today. So why don't you get started? Certainly, um, my name is Paolo Davanzo with the Echo Park Film Center. Uh, first of all, I just wanna say I'm humbled to be around such good friends and activists and artists. And so it's an honor to be here. I'm excited to be here today. Um, I'd rather kind of hear what you guys have to say, but I guess briefly, we've been around 16 years. We're a nonprofit media arts center. We do free film classes. We're a cinema. We're artists in residencies. We're many things. How it pertains to today is we try to take films outside into the community. We have an itinerant school bus. We do a lot of outdoor events. Um, we do things on si public sidewalks. And so we try to take art outside of the, the white gallery with the things hanging on walls and bring it to the people. So maybe that'll be relevant today, but thank you. I'm Nancy Buchanan, and um, I guess that I'm partly known as um, a member of the um, performance art group that uh, arose in the 1970s. And when I was a student, um, I realized that conceptual art really opened up everything so that it's not necessarily an object that is the art that one experiences, but the actual uh, event itself, whatever it is, whether it is just looking or whether it's something unfolding in front of you. So um, I think that uh, performance, in a sense, is really integral to uh, all the arts, including the visual arts. And um, also, it allows art to move into a public space and um, interact in a way that can activate the audience. I was also very influenced by the uh, San Francisco Mime Troupe as a young artist and did guerrilla theater. So that's my introduction. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Leister. And I'm uh, a visual artist, but I also do work in performance. Um, and over the last several years, I've been working, um, collaborating with dancers. And um, the work has a lot to do with memory and landscape. Um, and uh, feminist issues are um, very important to the work and, and to my process, and so it's amazing to be sitting next to Nancy Buchanan today. Um, and as far as how the work relates to the topic, um, I, my work has been shown in galleries and museums, but I also very much enjoy being outside of those spaces, um, which allow for a different kind of openness and experimentation um, within the work. And I'm Lynn Berman, and um, I think of myself primarily as a studio artist, but for some reason I keep going out of the studio and doing performance work. And uh, funnily enough, the COLA Award got me back into performance after I'd given it up for a while. And I've been going out into public spaces like library, courtyards, and I was just at the LA County Fair doing complaint centers, collaborating with poet Eve luck ring and um, it's a really different kind of experience being out in the public not really addressing an art audience but addressing a public audience and trying to see how to create a communication that centers around art and aesthetics and the ideas of art with people who aren't don't have the framework that a gallery audience would have you keep that. Oh. <laughs> um, I'm Karen Atkinson and I I guess it, about, probably about 80% of my work is done outside of uh, traditional spaces. Um, I've done really, I started actually in about 1986, in the mid-80s, doing work both as a curator as an, as, a, as an artist. I've also run businesses and nonprofit organizations as an art practice. Um, I've done things like make uh, parking meters talk in public places. Um, 
done a whole lot of work of artists working in slide form in the 80s because it was cheap for artists and then projecting them um, on, on uh, screens in non-traditional spaces and I did that all around the country in Johannesburg and Canada and various other places. So I uh, am definitely a DIY, DIY artist and um, most of the projects that I've done have been self-driven and self-produced. So instead of waiting for someone to tell me it was okay to do something, I generally kind of went ahead and did it myself. So that's my intro. That's great. Um, I'm, I'm Heidi Duckler and um, originally my company was called Collage Dance Theater. And um, now my company is called Heidi Duckler Dance Theater. And it's uh, 32 years old, and it is, um, it's a site-specific dance company. So um, all of my work is created um, on site. Uh, none of it is created in a studio and then transposed. So it's always a response to the environment, to the community, to um, the, uh, the location, all the content is um, directly um, um, inspired and planned and, um, and um, directly connected to place. Um, and um, it started, um, it started in, uh, well, the early 80s and um, when I was at UCLA getting my master's pretty much. And um, my, one of my first pieces was in a laundromat and I did a lot of non-heroic pieces in laundromats and gas stations and garages and uh, elevators and all those kinds of places. And then I did uh, pieces in more historic and historic sites and architectural sites. And I performed, um, we've done pieces all over the world and some of them vary in scale to being small and um, larger pieces. Um, primarily with dancers, but also with all kinds of artists, composers, and visual artists, and um, they're very interdisciplinary. And um, so, yeah, that's how we got going, and I'm sure there'll be a lot to talk about. But um, there's a very deep connection, I've been hearing this so far, but the, with the audience um, in those kinds of pieces, and, and I'd like to talk about that a little bit further down the road. Um, my name is Anna Boyazis. And I want to say first that um, my career started as a graphic designer, and I designed a lot of art and architecture publications for art and architecture institutions. Um, but there was always a nagging inside of me, even before grad school, that I wanted to be a photojournalist and a documentary photographer. So in um, around 20, no, 2006, I started making that transition. Um, received the COLA Award in 2011 and was pretty still very fresh in my career. Um, but that work that I was working on for COLA has evolved into a 10-year body of work that um, I'm now uh, making into my first monograph. So I'll be designing that. Um, and it's interesting how the whole process has come around from design to photography and now to design again. Um, and I thank COLA for that. Um, my work happens on the other side of the world, um, usually in Sub-Saharan Africa and East Africa, um, and not in Los Angeles, except for the editing and the writing. And uh, that's it. I'm er Ernesto de la Loza, native born Angelino. Uh, I was a 2005 COLA grant recipient, and I've been painting on this corridor on the streets uh, for almost 50 years. Uh, 25 years uh, on Sunset Boulevard, another 15 on Cesar Chavez, then Brooklyn. So I, I kind of uh, try to emulate uh, this fashion of uh, being part of the inner city. And, and I'm from the 60s, so I'm part of the underground cult. Uh, you know, we're the hippies from the 60s, actually. And people Woo today say, well, we're hippies. <laughs> I go, well, you have a lot of catching up to do. <laughs> but I, I like to, uh, uh, the, the environment has so much impact on the, on, on the artist's way and the way he sees the world. So I kind of try to uh, capture this, uh, this, this moment. Uh, I consider this a historical corridor. And this is a destination around the world, LA, Southern California. This is the farthest west man can go. And we're here to meet and to uh, try to uh, guide uh, humanity into the future. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Ernesto De La Rosa. Oh, sorry. Of the pot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My name is uh, Phil Ranlin, and I, I'm a trombonist. Um, I received uh, the cola in 2007 to uh, perform, uh, compose and perform music dedicated to uh, the famous female trombonist Melba Liston. So uh, prior to that, of course, uh, I go back way back, you know, like uh, in terms of uh, being involved in, in the arts and music in particular. So uh, I'm a firm believer in art, influencing art and impacting positivity into the world so I uh, got caught up into that belief years ago so I'm somewhat a junkie I guess and <laughs> in terms of uh, not giving up on it and uh, believing in it and uh, looking forward to the next day even when there are no gigs in sight <laughs> anyway uh, looking forward to the rest of the afternoon Okay, so um, one of the things, the questions that's come up, which I'd like all of you to chime in with, and maybe you guys could share that mic, and you guys could share that mic, is about the historical precedence of the kind of work that we make. And I think actually a lot of people here established that historical precedence, which I find really interesting. Um, when I was, uh, when I founded a nonprofit organization, Side Street Projects, and we were the first gallery to move downtown, I got really interested in finding out the historical aspects of artists working in downtown Los Angeles. So I curated a show called Downtown and went and looked up all these artists who had made this amazing work, mostly in the streets in the 60s and the 70s, uh, primarily. And it was a really amazing show. But most of those artists that I contacted had been doing things outside of the gallery. Either they uh, weren't making the kind of work that a gallery wanted to show and there weren't very many galleries in LA uh, back in the 60s and 70s, and the wealth of work that was done in the streets in downtown was really amazing. So I'm wondering if people have uh, different comments they'd like to make about either things that influence them or ways that they see that historical precedence in Los Angeles. Um, I immediately, when I saw the, the prompt for this panel, thought about uh, Woman House and um, the women's, women's building. Um, and the work that was coming out of there in the in the 60s and 70s, and um, uh, you know all different types of performance in all different types of spaces, and I think that that has um, well, it's been influential on my work, but I think on LA in in general, and I'm sure Nancy can speak to that, um, uh, you know, in in more depth. But um, for me, that stands out um, very, very strongly. Yeah, well, um, I was thinking about uh, some of the events that um, I, f I find really profound that, that happened in the past. One of these was um, a, uh, a public performance organized by Suzanne Lacey and Leslie Labowitz called In Mourning and In Rage. And the event was in response to the Hillside Strangler murders that had happened in Los Angeles, but not just a response in anger uh, in terms of these terrible murders, but specifically targeting the way that the press represented the events with logos that featured a silhouette of a woman and um, discussion that made it seem that women should just stay inside and lock their doors rather than really addressing things that were wrong. And so they did this um, funeral procession that led to City Hall and they had a press conference and all the press indeed came out. And in response, one of the amazing things that happened was that the telephone company which had refused to list rape uh, hotline crisis numbers in the phone book immediately said they were going to do that. And the LA Council people came out. Um, it was really, um, it was, 
it was really an amazing result, and, and it was uh, something organized by artists. Um, I was also thinking of laundromats, and another feminist group who called themselves Mother Art, and they came out of the woman's building. They got a tiny, a teeny, tiny little California Arts Council grant. And so they uh, developed a series of pieces that they called laundry works. And these were public performances in laundromats, unannounced. They showed up with flyers in English and in Spanish. They had pillowcases with words on them that they invited the public to um, put in order and make a poem. Their performances were as long as a wash cycle. It was one of the most generous things I have ever seen artists do. And, you know, the money that Ronald Reagan complained about this, this little group of artists getting was so, so well spent. So. That's wonderful. That's really great. That's a wonderful story. Um, I, I wanted to, you know, add to the, the laundromat experience. And one of the things that um, it was one of my first pieces in the '80s. And um, one of the things that I learned in doing that piece was that we were rehearsing, you know, in the laundromat, and you know, in the washers and the dryers, and and you know, as we rehearsed on site and and a, you know, weekly, and we found that people who do their wash on a weekly basis, right? So we would have this sort of built-in audience watching us rehearse and. Um, and, and so unbeknownst, I mean, I didn't even think about this would happen, but they would be watching the process of the work being built. And that was really interesting to me. And these were people, of course, that didn't, you know, they didn't traditionally go to the theater or to see dance or, you know, it wasn't that kind of a crowd. So, um, and they were, but they were understanding how the, a dance was being built and created and choreographed and they were intrigued and every, every week they would come back and they would see, you know, see something new and 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 this was so unusual to me um, and I I just love this new audience that um, that we were gaining and um, and I just was wondering if anyone wanted to speak to um, to this sort of new audience that this work kind of generates and um, and makes does anyone want to talk about the, the audience um, well <laughs> I um, have been having these experiences over the past year doing public performances and it's a little awkward sometimes because what we're offering, we're not sure how the public might be perceiving or understanding it. So for instance, someone will submit a complaint and the poet will respond and I'll make a drawing and sometimes the poems are quite abstract and sometimes the drawings are peculiar and not maybe a style that people might think they'd want to hang on their wall. But I found people were very curious and they were open and receptive. And there seemed to be a really interesting experience within the exchange. Like we all seemed to have some level of transformation through it. And so it was a very different than just maybe presenting the work on the wall and watching people observe. I had to keep responding to how people were responding. I first did some, uh, curated some projects actually when I was um, working in a space in San Diego and um, <clears throat> it was also the mid 80s and we had written a grant and managed to get a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit of money. And so what we did is we actually chose three neighborhoods in San Diego that did not have any arts things going on practically and we commissioned people to create performances that happened on the street in some way. And that was really interesting because we went into communities that weren't being represented uh, by the city and things like that. And we did these amazing performances, which at that time, nobody was doing that work uh, very um, obviously, especially in a city like San Diego, which uh, has fabulous weather, but is a little bit conservative. Um, so we had... <laughs> We had, uh, <clears throat> we actually had a full-on choir performing in front of a Taco Bell in uh, southeast San Diego, which was the euphemism for um, African-American community. Um, and we actually went to La Jolla, which had a museum, but nothing else was going on, and did a whole performance there, and then did something in Ocean Beach, which was uh, the kind of hippie part of town of San Diego. And all of them have really amazing stories about how the audience responded. 
So for instance, the California Arts Council decided to visit us when we did a performance in Ocean Beach. And there was a guy who was doing a performance and he um, made himself up to uh, look like a homeless person. And he walked onto the, the set, more or less, and people started trying to get him to go away because like this was art, right? Um, and so people were giving him cigarettes and giving him money and he said, wow, that's a really amazing thing. And then he went over and then he started performing and all of a sudden the whole audience realized this was not a homeless person, this was an artist who was doing a performance and uh, shocked the heck out of a lot of different people, but it was, it was quite spectacular. So there's really, really great stories from the beginning and I think that um, the audiences have changed drastically which is another interesting topic we'll get to. But you had something to say? No, I was going to say, you know, creating your own audience, uh, that's what we have to do, I guess, as artists. So uh, interestingly enough, myself and my promoter a few years ago had this idea about presenting music in the train stops, you know, you know, like just like in the laundromat or whatever. and in front of Taco Bell, <laughs> I mean, wherever, you know, wherever there's people. So, uh, yeah, it's so important uh, to make sure that the continuum, I mean, art is, is, is everyday life. So uh, as artists, we have to uh, figure out ways how to present it. So that's all I had to say about that. But uh, it's some very novel ideas about how to keep it alive, you know, yeah. Yeah, um, no, that's, that's really wonderful. Um, and we, uh, we did a piece at the, um, well, we did a piece in Miami first, um, and then uh, another piece in, in Los Angeles, both at hotels, and turning the hotel uh, inside out, where um, the audience went to uh, sort of, thinking about the hotel as the backstage where you know you would see uh, the maids, the housekeepers, and bringing them all outside of the hotel um, into the lobby and um, you know sort of flipping the whole thing and um, it was a really a great piece and um, looking at you know what you don't really see when you go into a hotel you know you don't see that that sort of other side and um, and I think it's really interesting how site work and and um, and work outside the box um, can be very political and and very um, talk about a lot of social justice um, and so when we did the piece in um, Los Angeles um, and in Los Angeles it was just right after um, we were rehearsing and they were very you know they were, they were very much about the rules and oh don't touch that and you know in the lobby and oh don't slide down that banister and oh you know they were you know the security guards there were you know that was their job to say no to this and no to that and you know and and they were very, making it very difficult for us to um, to do our job which was to of course explore the the lobby and, and um, you know dance all over the furniture um, which is what we do. So, um, but anyway, 9-11 happened and, and, and the hotel was empty and nobody was staying there. It was, it was a horrible place. And, and so, but we arrived for work on the next day. And, um, uh, and so the security guard said, you're here? And we said, yeah, we're here. We have rehearsal. And he, he just started crying and he, he just hugged us and he said, I'm so happy to see you. And um, so we, we started sliding down the banisters and he just let us do whatever we wanted. And, um, and we just somehow managed to bring some joy into the space. So it's kind of interesting how things get flipped in such ways that you don't expect. I maybe have a couple thoughts on that. I think, um, Karen, I heard you ask about precedent and how you build an audience, also from Heidi. Um, we, I'm a filmmaker and an educator, but it's a very pervasive thing to be in a city that often films about commodity and about wealth and fame and fortune. So when you make a people's film center, which everyone is treated equally, and you know, a kid with, 11-year-old kid with braces or a, you know, a 50-year-old hipster, hotshot filmmaker, they're all loved, they're all adored, right? But when we opened in 2001, um, film was still expensive. It was still, I, I like to say, one of the most um, accessible art forms for the consumer 
but one of the least accessible for the producer, right? Computers were expensive, cameras were expensive, and how do you democratize that process, right? Also the notion of a cinema, you come to a place, you pay money to get in, so that's why we bought the school bus to bring films to the people outdoors, right? Um, in the sense, in the, the noble tradition of itinerant cinema that was in India and Mexico all over the world, these caravans would go town to town and show films. So we've continued that process to bring film to people, to communities, often potluck meals are involved, sharing food, sharing ideas, sharing love, sharing space. And I think that's um, one of the pivotal roles that we can be as artists is to bring, make people feel comfortable in the setting that they're interacting with the art and, the, and those sort of things. So those are my two bits. So one of the things I did want to talk about is the sort of shift in uh, the audience and the way we all work. So Heidi and I were talking yesterday and reminiscing about getting into so much trouble uh, <laughs> because we were doing things that weren't really known. We were stepping outside of um, the arts context in a way and um, we were kind of making up as we went along. We were getting our funding and our resources from places that weren't conventional at all. Um, so one of the interesting things that happened is that people were often beside themselves <laughs> when we would show up to do something and or um, we had to do a lot of explaining. An example um, in my case would be um, I uh, across the street from the Beverly Center and where the Hard Rock C Cafe is, there, uh, there's now a hotel, but there used to be a big parking lot and a kind of little strip mall. And um, I decided with a friend of mine that um, it was really reasonable and fairly cheap for artists to create work in slide form. And um, so I commissioned a whole bunch of artists, about 40 um, from around the country, to make work either anywhere from one to four slides. And they weren't actually you know, uh, pictures of artwork they'd made, but they were made very site specifically for the site. So there was a place called the Bloomsbury, uh, Bloomsbury F uh, Flower Mart and uh, had this very long conversation with them about, you know, creating a space. So we talked them into it and they allowed us to build a rear projection screen in the front window. So we wanted to do this in a non-art space. Um, and so that negotiation was always very interesting, which I'm imagining a lot of you, the idea of negotiation is so much a part of the work that we do. And so, um, so the, it was a flower market by day and at night the rear screen would come down and we would rear project from dusk to midnight. Um, and I've since done that project in um, other kinds of sites, done it in furniture stores and just odd little places all around the country, um, bookstores and architect's office in San Diego. And what was so fascinating about that is that the audience weren't necessarily, you didn't have a direct relationship with them because it was from dusk to midnight and I would be sitting behind the screen. So I would hear all these really great conversations about this new form and people would be walking by and see something and pretty soon they'd have to stop and have a conversation about it. So it was fascinating. So I ended up doing these kinds of projects whereby I included a lot of artists and the audience, um, you know, wasn't, it wasn't kind of a direct relationship, which was interesting. Um, so I learned a lot from people about what they thought about these kind of interventions um, uh, in that process. And I think now it's very different when we make work. Um, I think that it's still difficult to negotiate a space, but at least people have heard about it, so it's not quite as difficult. Um, one other example is that um, Sylvia Boyer and I um, commissioned then commissioned artists to make work in slide form and projected it and two commercial theaters in between the popcorn and trivia slides. Remember those really bad, awful slides of popcorn and chiropractors and all of that? So we went to the National Cinema Network and we managed to get these slides inserted. And it was the first time uh, technology-wise that you could actually create a, a slide from an image on the computer. So we worked with all the artists. It was the first time you could do that. So we had some technological help. So you made a two inch by, you know, small slide and then we projected them in those movie theaters on 12 screens, both the Magic Johnson Theater and the AMC Theater in Pasadena. And uh, for three months, every single intermission in both those, all those uh, 12 theaters, uh, you got to see this artwork. The really uncanny thing is there was an attorney for the National Cinema Network and they censored a bunch of the work at the last minute. So what we found out on the down low is they thought we had figured out how to subliminally put messages in the pixels. And so, 
they, we scared the shit out of them. <laughs> the heck out of them, sorry, you could edit that out. <laughs> so it's like things like this where you have to, you know, the negotiation just kind of doesn't stop. And so um, that was a really interesting thing. Even so some of the work was made very specifically for the Magic Johnson theaters, these, you know, um, upper echelon attorneys, um, white as can be, just didn't get it at all. So we ran like hell and decided to do it at the Lemley Theaters downtown and did it for three years. And there were no popcorn and trivia slides in those. It was all just a, a pure art exhibition of artists' work. And every three months we would curate a new show or do something. So again, there's very interesting sort of shifts. I'd like to hear maybe some of the experiences that you have about making this kind of work. Yeah, I think that's a very, very interesting topic. Um, if you'd like to chime in, I mean, I think that, you know, life has changed so much. Um, you know, we used to be able to um, kind of do what we wanted a little bit more, and um, now there's always insurance and lawyers and people following us around, and a lot of this work um, is, um, is a little bit unplanned, you know, um, because if it's responsive, um, as an artist, um, you need to have that ability to be, um, to be um, extemporaneous and um, sometimes I'm always being asked, okay, what are you planning on doing here? You know, well, you know, I, <laughs> you know, I, I need some freedom. Yeah, right? And you need some freedom to, um, to experiment. And, um, and sometimes uh, it's hard for um, the, uh, the bureaucrats and, and, um, and, and, you know, those who um, run venues to, to understand that and, um, and uh, makes it difficult to, um, when you want to be able to subvert a space and, um, and, you know, and use it in ways that are unconventional. Um, that you may not know exactly what you're doing at first because you want to improvise and play and um, and so you would need the freedom to experiment and that uh, goes against the grain um, in uh, institutional institutions um, you know which are not accustomed to that kind of um, that kind of work so anyone want to respond to that You've been doing this for 50 years. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, there, there was a rebellion uh, in 1970, the uh, assassination of uh, Ruben Salazar, okay, and Cesar Chavez stated, show your solidarity, take your art to the streets, and foolish me, I'm still doing it today. <laughs> but uh, we broke the, tra tra the tradition of uh, conventional art, gallery art, but we had books by Robin Dunnett's, uh, a colleague uh, who said uh, street gallery so we titled this thing and and the audience I go well, who's your audience I go well worldwide you know because uh, uh, we uh, we had guidelines and they said give art to the people who don't have art so so it, it was a new thing and and you have historians talking about our life's work today you know so it's a great accomplishment but then there became a moratorium, you have eminent domain issues, and then you have intellectual property rights. I shouldn't know this. I'm just a kid on the streets, you know, but mm -hmm. all this weighs in, and hopefully we have a, a little clearing today where we can really close the argument and say this is people's art. Yeah, well, yeah. all these ideas are swirling around in my head, but I can't really uh, convey <laughs> <laughs> but uh, a, a lot of <laughs> things that have been said remind me of a t of once when I received, okay, I received a COLA grant, which led to my receiving another grant to do uh, workshops on uh, Eric Dolphy in Panama. And so uh, we had everything in place. Uh, we received a grant, of course, a uh, three, three-week residency in Panama. I had no venue to perform the workshops. I didn't uh, even, well, I had a place to stay. But everything, what I'm getting at is everything was not in place, and so we had to improvise. Uh, actually, I went by myself, but my promoter was back here in LA emailing people and this, that, and other. And so anyway, when I get to, <laughs> when I arrive in Panama, 
they told me that I had a meeting to meet with uh, the Danilo Perez Foundation to see if that would be a potential place to present the workshops on Eric Dolphy, who happened to uh, have had parents who were Panamanian. That's how we approached the, the whole thing. So <laughs> anyway, I go to this, um, I go to this meeting and there are people, I don't speak any Spanish at all. There are people s sitting there, you know, talking in Spanish and everyone is smiling and I'm talking and they seem like they maybe understood what I was saying. So anyway, at the end of the meeting, everyone smiled at me and they were actually interviewing me to see if they wanted me to present workshops in their venue. Little did I know, I didn't know that at the time. But anyway, uh, these two elderly people look at me and, and they said, uh, you need a ride to the hotel. I said, oh yeah, thank you. So I'm riding in, the, in their car. I don't know if any of you know the name Danilo Perez, but he's a pretty famous jazz pianist from Panama. And he has a foundation, a major foundation, 20 pianos and, and it's, you know, in the complex. Anyway, I'm in the car and this uh, elderly gentleman uh, is driving and uh, <laughs> I said, by the way, how do you know DeLillo? And he said, uh, he kind of smiled and said, I miss Papa. I said, oh my God. So his DeLillo's parents took me to uh, the hotel and that led to uh, me coming back in 2015 performing on the Panama Jazz Festival as one of the headliners and the whole festival was dedicated to Eric Dolphy which I had originally actually uh, done the workshop so yeah we all have to figure out ways of doing what we do I guess it comes down to that I'm sure I'm sorry for jumping off the oh, subject. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody have any questions they want to bring up? Or? I was just wondering to follow up on, you know, the restrictions and uh, contracts and liabilities. I mean, do, do, do people have ways around those kinds of barriers? I mean, um, are, are there more difficulties in just giving your work away publicly and w what are some creative ways that artists have dealt with that? Anybody? Great question. Intellectual property lawyers. You have to have lawyers. <laughs> oh, no more I hate lawyers. I say that. <laughs> but there's around two intellectual property lawyers. One's in uh, San Francisco and a couple are here in Pasadena. But uh, I've, I've been in litigation for 10 years and it almost killed me. I mean, it, it just kills your creativity. Uh, and, but that's the struggle. And, but, uh, what exactly do, do you need them to do for you? Well, y your work gets whitewashed. There's eminent domain. Everything I've done has been under attack and destroyed. And I have, I, gave my life to this city 50 years and it comes to the point uh, now we're full circle uh, I'm getting back on my feet again I'm able to paint on the streets engage with the children and the public because it's their demand they want to see the artist now there's four or five generations of artists uh, popping up left and right and that's that's the reward so artists uh, have to be thick-skinned it's not about talent but it's perseverance and stamina. <laughs> <laughs> I'm negotiating access, which is a whole different type of negotiation where I'm involved in a community for more than a month, maybe a month or two months, um, proving to them why I'm committed to their story and that they can trust me. Um, and often, most recently, I was in Tanzania teaching English lessons to their people to show that I was devoted to them. So it's like the flip side of what you're talking about, but I understand the negotiation um, is a part of it. Well, I have had a past where I, I guess I break rules because I will just show up 
and do things and I sometimes get kicked out. And um, I've found it's been kind of interesting, like at the public library, didn't, we didn't get permission and we set up like this structure and the guards kept coming around and going, well, what are you doing? And apparently the land we were on wasn't even owned by the library, it was owned by a private company and they had their, their own guards and I think they were all actors who were rehearsing their lines. And finally they just said, what, I mean, it was so weird, they're like, just don't, don't, and don't disrupt the wedding going on. I'm like, okay, <laughs> well, they may have some complaints. But what I wanted to bring up with, was the idea of what is public space and how important public space is and how so much of our culture now, people are going into public spaces that are extremely controlled places like the Americana, the Grove, and finding the unexpected. Even people don't go to movies anymore. People are not going, people aren't going out as much into kind of unexpected environments. And I think maybe this idea of doing these performative works in the world out in public space, which is part of, I think, what this whole salon is about, is to, to invest the energy into public space, which I think is extremely important politically right now. I think that's very interesting uh, subject about uh, you know what is public space and is it public space or uh, so much public space is actually private space. Um, it's very confusing and I think that it does tie into what you're saying about community support and um, and you know and and that space and who owns that space and um, and how is it you know how is it managed. Um, does anyone want to talk about that? I think that's a very fascinating subject. Nancy? Yeah, well, what about also the way that there's rumors that maybe protest will become illegal? There will be laws passed um, against people being able to come out and express their opinions. And I feel that that's one of the most important things right now is to make sure that the people of this country can be heard um, because there's so much like alternative stuff floating around, whether it's called fact or whatever you want to call it. So um, I think that everyone in the arts can contribute by making sure that we keep the pressure on to keep some spaces open to the public. Okay, so, oh, <laughs> stay in the street, stop, what's his name? <laughs> Just in case this is a bi-political audience you know, <laughs> or something. <laughs> um, so does anybody have anything particular that they want to bring up? So one of the things that I'm struck by is the shift in how artists work these days. Um, and I think part of the, the idea of thinking about the precedence of what we all do um, is really interesting. And that's one of the reasons why I um, did a whole bunch of research to sort of find out what had taken place in Los Angeles because a lot of those artists weren't being talked about at all anymore, but their work was actually really amazing. Um, I think there's a lot of artists who um, looked at the public space as another venue, but a way in which there's such a diversity of the way that we all work. So if you go into a space without permission, that's one thing. Um, I always chose to negotiate a space that seemed like it was hard as hell. Um, and therefore, people wouldn't give me money because they thought, there's no way that you can pull that off. So I, you know, when I was working on the project um, to put artists' uh, slides in the theaters, it was a 13-year project. I proposed it to every artist-run space in Los Angeles, and they all said, that's too big. You're never going to pull it off. Um, so it took 13 years to be able to get a small amount of money as some sort of seed funding and make it work. Um, when the lawyer decided to censor the images, we decided that we would make it incredibly public and we built, it was, it was when websites were first using graphic images and you could actually put something up on the internet. Um, nobody actually really knew much about what it was, but that was a really interesting way to push talking about public. Um, and then we also put all the artist images in a reel, uh, and the, the idea was that they were created this high-tech way, but we actually put them on reels in a Viewmaster. So the way that you actually looked at them was in the lowest tech way possible. <laughs> so we were always pushing those kinds of ideas about 
finding a theater in a national cinema network or going after donations from a national company and trying to make that stuff work. And um, huge thing about um, negotiation. And um, I have a quote on the wall, and actually my favorite art supply is tenacity. Maybe you guys can kind of talk about what your favorite art supplies are in terms of the making this kind of work. You, you're, you're, uh, talk about your, uh, yeah. So you have a CD called Perseverance. Yeah. Maybe you could talk about that, why you named it that. Yeah, this is great because uh, this is a result of the COLA Award uh, in 2007. As I said earlier, I, I uh, presented, um, I composed and performed music for Melba Liston. And uh, perseverance is what I've been about all my life. And so um, when I did the, the CD came as a result of the 2007 COLA Award, which I dedicated three songs on this uh, CD to uh, Melba Liston. So that's the connection with that. But uh, um, the story of my life is perseverance because uh, I've had to, as an independent, and all of us, actually everyone in here is independent in a sense because uh, we figure out ways how to do what we do. And uh, I was always told that if you believe in what you do, then it should take care of you. And so, um, so far, so good. <laughs> but uh, I don't know, it's, uh, I'm so, I feel honored to be involved with a you know, group of artists and I've been honored to have been involved with some great musicians in my lifetime. I first, uh, the first guitar player that I played with in my life was Wes Montgomery in 1959. And from that point, he convinced me that I could make it as a musician. So uh, uh, I ended up with Motown Records and Motown Records uh, allowed me to form Tribe Records, which was an independent label in Detroit that led to this. <laughs> so. It's a continuum. Sorry for the rambling. Well, uh, Barry, Barry Gordy. Yeah. 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 You know, I've done street art, uh, and I define my life through street art. Then you have uh, the LA Phil uses my my. Uh, artwork as cover art for the opera. So this transformation from street to opera, it was a great honor that Dudamel, John Adams, uh, they used my art as cover for that. So it, it really inspired me that, to have a classless view of things in it. I think this was a success that what I stood for and what I, I strive for was to have a classless world, uh, you know, as puritanical as that can be. So it, it's a great honor uh, uh, to be at this point in time, like all of my, our colleagues here, that uh, we've, we've accomplished something and, and we're just uh, part of that curve and we're yeah. still in progress. So uh, painting uh, street art uh, and being around this corridor, to get into this, uh, this is, the most majestic gallery in the city. And, and I, I call this place the hill. So it was, it was an, a, a struggle, a struggle, a struggle, but to be a recipient was like uh, climbing another mountain. I covered the Pyrenees, the Rockies, the Metro Cons, all on bicycle. So part of the stamina, but this was a great challenge and it, it gave me breathing room to, to uh, be identified as an artist of the city, which isn't a given thing. If there's zip codes or class uh, division, um, this is an issue that's so, com so uh, compromised and confounding today. Uh, in 93, I, I did Bridges to East LA. That was the title of a piece 
bridge, bridges that divide or bring communities together. Now we're building walls. End of conversation. Yeah. Can you talk about your color experience? Yes, I think it challenged me to be a curator. And that was a new um, thing to trust that I knew what to choose um, to put up. That's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think when uh, when I was asked to uh, do a performance in the in, in here in the gallery, uh, um, that was a huge challenge for me um, because um, I, it's not what I. Since then, I have created some work in galleries, but typically, you know, because we always create the work on site and, we, and that's all we do. It was a that was a big challenge, and so we brought um, a, we brought a large object. Um, inside the gallery that we could respond to and we did that and um, we moved it through the crowd and outside the gallery actually we ended up moving it outside the gallery and into the space into the garden space and so we did kind of break through these doors and the walls kind of in our own way but um, so we found a way to make that um, to, to do that in an authentic way for us um, but, um, yeah, it took some thinking and working out. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll go ahead. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so for me, I actually uh, work uh, everywhere all the time. <laughs> yeah. So it wasn't really particularly a problem. What was so interesting to me about the COLA Award is that um, I actually have three ruptured discs, and at the time I was in a wheelchair for six months. And I had made this proposal to do this giant, big, fabulous thing, right? You know, because I'm so used to doing big stuff and installation work. And I couldn't do any of that. And so what was interesting is that it forced me to completely rethink my work. And because of COLA, I was able to get a computer where I could start actually making um, movies as the best sort of um, element I can think of. But I made a work about my great aunt who was in the Japanese internment camps and she was one of very few Caucasians. She married a Japanese man. And I projected this work on a glow-in-the-dark screen, which is very, very hard to document, so there may be no historical reference to my COLA project, actually. Um, but it actually allowed me to be able to sort of shift my work, and it completely changed what I did. And I think now I wouldn't be doing the work that I am doing now, as well as running a business and, and being a software developer and all those oddball things. So. Um, in answer to the question that was posed, my right and left brains talk to each other, which is kind of sometimes kind of odd. Um, so I am much more interested in the site, whether it's in a gallery or outside of a gallery, that the site becomes really, really important to me, and everything that I do is site-specific in some way, shape, or form. Well, I think I alluded to before that the COLA grant kind of pushed me back into performance art and I think it literally pushed me because the year I got it was a weird year where we were asked to do a public art project in addition to our COLA grant and Joe Smoke could address that because I still don't quite understand but anyway so we all looked at each other like well we have a COLA we have a public art where we don't do public art and so I had to come up with an idea of like I'm going to do public art I didn't want to just hang my drawings than in the gallery, I thought I'll go do a public art piece. And it, I think it helped me to start rethinking ideas about public space and interaction and performance. So it was unexpected and I had to uh, come up with something. So that was my Cole experience. And it did influence work that I'm involved with now that I hadn't planned on, be do I hadn't planned on doing at the time. <laughs> I, um, I really enjoy working in both ways, and I, I do work in both ways. Uh, my COLA experience uh, allowed me to do a performance here that was much more polished, I guess, than the way I had gone about it um, doing similar types of performance with dance and drawing previously, so um, that was wonderful. And... Um, I keep thinking about this one project that I was involved with um, 
couple years ago, uh, Cindy Ream, who runs, uh, or she was running a um, organization called Crafts in One House, partnered with Hinterculture, and we did a huge day of installation and performance out in the desert. Um, it was the 100th anniversary of the Llano del Rio um, commune out there, and it was based on this uh, female architect who um, designed the, the, the space there, but it never, actually, um, it never actually got built because they realized they ran out of water and had to move on. So um, that was an extremely challenging project. Um, we had gone out previously, and all of the artists selected uh, basically where they were going to create a performance or an installation. Uh, but then the actual day of the performance, it was incredibly windy and my performance ended up being at like five o'clock in the afternoon when it was, I don't know, like 102 degrees. Mm -hmm. So um, all of my plans, uh, they didn't completely fall through, but I had anticipated performing for a good 20 minutes and could barely get through 10 minutes. Um, but I enjoy that kind of challenge um, and sort of, I don't know, being flexible to um, you know, what might occur in, in the moment yeah. in a really challenging space like the desert. Um, so yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. Or yeah. yeah, traditionally galleries freak me out. I don't feel welcome there. I don't feel, I feel I'm not cool enough. I'm not beautiful enough. I'm not, I don't get, I don't get it. I can't afford it. So I mean, in general, I'm not a fan of, of galleries. But when, when Cola approaches you, this is the people's gallery. I mean, I look at that list of the last 20 years and I, I want to cry. Some of these artists that yeah. have been my mentors, have been my friends, some are no longer with us perhaps. And um, so this really feels, it always has, is like the people's gallery, right? So to be here is something very special. I think when Joe asked that question, I, I saw him kind of maybe look at me and, and look at all of us, but I spent a lifetime helping others. My mother said, always nurture the system, replenish the system. She was an activist, died when I was very young. And so I've committed my life to helping others. But when someone says, you're beautiful, you're powerful, here's $10,000, make your own work. <laughs> It's wonderful, and you know, and I did, I, you know, I, yeah, and, and so I, I think everything has its place. This gallery has a tremendous history and it has a place, but I think in general, um, yeah, we need to keep bringing art to the people. We need to keep making people feel comfortable with art and not feeling that you have to be cool, you have to be beautiful, you have to enter this pristine space, so. Um. So I know we have to wrap up. I'm going to give each of you a chance to just uh, make a closing comment, so why don't you start? Oh, I think I just did, yeah. Okay. I'll pass, yeah. Okay. Um, Parting words. Yeah. Um, well, this place has always been, to me, um, really key for the city of Los Angeles. I mean, at a time when diversity wasn't as uh, celebrated as it is now, you could always find diversity in this space, and you could see, you know, the rainbow of artists that work in Los Angeles. And... Um, to, uh, to have your work validated by your peers is also, I think, one of the most meaningful things in an artist's life. So uh, everything about um, the COLA program, I think, is, is incredible and wonderful and should continue. Um, yeah, I would, I would back that up completely. Um, you know, the COLA grant, uh, it's wonderful to get that money to be able to buy some equipment or supplies or pay for dancers, um, collaborators. Um, but um, along with that is just this really wonderful feeling um, being supported by um, the LA art community and, and artists here. So, um, yeah. Um, thank you, Cola. And I just think it's really um, exciting to be around a group of other people who work in various ways in performance and, and are offering also free experiences to people because again, so much in our culture now is about buying and selling as I think Pablo uh, mentioned and you know, not just having an experience. So I think in performance you can offer that. Uh, I got my COLA grant in 1999, so it was one of the first ones. And it was, um, I mean, now there's actually funding for artists from a lot of different sources, but back then there was practically nothing. 
and uh, the culture wars were going on, the NEA was in crisis, all these different things had been going on for a long time. So to get that was actually really amazing at the time uh, because it was one of the few times that you could actually sit back and make a decision about what you wanted to do, not necessarily what you felt, felt compelled to do. Um, I think that um, you know, it's a really great way to bring artists together. It's a way to sort of celebrate the art in Los Angeles and I think that COLA has been um, an amazing historical precedence in Los Angeles and I'm glad to be a part of it. So I wanna thank all of you yeah, ditto with everything that's been said. I'm just so happy to be here. I mean, the Cola Grand is such an honor and, um, you know, it's just, uh, it's so special. And, you know, I realize that this is a municipal. I love that word municipal. We I hardly ever use that word. Uh, there's a <laughs> municipal gallery, right? And um, it gives you such a civic pride and, and pride in your city and your colleagues and, um, you know, it's it's both um, it's it's uplifting and it's also just kind of grounding at the same time. You just feel, um, you know, I just feel so comfortable and um, and uh, elated at the same time. It's just really great, and I'm I'm very thankful. And I just got to hear what all you. I just got to meet you for the first time, many of you, and um, so it's just been great. And thank you so much. A lot of others have talked about how the grant changed their trajectory. I had already changed my trajectory, so it was more confirming that people cared about what I was working on, and that was so valuable um, in those years. Um, and it challenged me to go deeper into a body of work that I'd, I had already been working on and continued to work on and really went deeper and deeper, so I'm thankful for that. Um, the confidence in me to do so. See you at the laundromat. Uh, <laughs> I do my best business in, in thinking and exchanging <laughs> at the laundromat today. <laughs> okay, yeah, well, the Cola Grant did wonders for me, and especially at the time uh, in 2007, I was just kind of recovering from a near fatal accident, which happened at the end of 05. And so, uh, I really had only been performing for out of the wheelchair at least for about f five or six months. But anyway, um, the Cola Grant's too bad it only happens once, but uh, I was so grateful and thankful to have received it. And as I stated earlier, it led to a lot of wonderful things after that. So, yeah, thank you, Cola. So I want to thank all of you for participating. This has been really fabulous. It's really great to actually hear, um, you know, what has perpetuated and created all this. And I want to thank you all also for your historical precedence of actually creating the genre uh, in the first place and perpetuating such an interesting dialogue. So thank you very much. Yep. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>